Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to the Great Books course of the Wisdom School and Ubiquity University, where every month we delve into one of the great books of human history that has exerted influence across time and across cultures to transform lives and change the way people think of themselves and the world. Uh, this month, I'm giving the second of uh, two lectures on Machiavelli's The Prince, arguably one of the most influential books of certainly the modern period. I don't personally, I can't think personally of a work that has reshaped ethics, philosophy, politics, economics, science more fundamentally than Machiavelli's The Prince. And it is very timely, I think, for us to explore uh, this uh, subject in light of our current political and economic and cultural and ethical uh, situation in which we find ourselves in 2017 on planet Earth. Because what Machiavelli wrote and what he proposed as a new form of uh, understanding the world and the exercise of power is now completely normative around the world. So we're delving into one of the truly truly great books of human uh, history. I want to summarize, first of all, the point I was seeking to make uh, last month. And that is that, uh, as paradoxical as it may seem by the time this lecture is over, uh, Machiavelli lived and wrote uh, this great work in the midst of the rise and fall of the Renaissance in Florence, the city-state in Italy, which during the 15th century uh, rose to an extraordinary, almost Athenian level of greatness and personified the Renaissance spirit in a very, very fundamental way. And I want to start the lecture today by recalling the situation in which the Renaissance and Machiavelli wrote. And I want to end the lecture today after exploring uh, Machiavelli. What is a fundamental for us to understand and a fundamental shift in our notion of the Renaissance? Remember that what I said last time is that the Renaissance was not an event. It's not like the French Revolution in 1789 or the American Revolution in 1776. It's not an event. It's a worldview. It's what Marseille Eliade would call a, a energizing myth. It was the way individuals understood themselves in the world, which seemed to them almost nonsensical, dysfunctional violent and cruel. And I want to dwell on this because we will find analogies in our own time. Historians often talk about the crisis of the 14th century. Uh, and that was the time during which the Renaissance began to emerge. Everything possible went wrong. In the 12th and 13th centuries in the high water mark of the feudal period, the high Middle Ages, as it was called. Europe flourished, economies boomed, population expanded, cities were engaging in trade, and so productive and so flourishing was the late Middle Ages that populations all across Europe began to till marginal land, 
to keep up with growing populations. And then beginning in about uh, 1315 to about 1322, there was a climate change episode that brought flooding and inclement weather to Europe at levels that made the people then recall the flood of Noah. It was a biblical proportion. Crops collapsed. And with the collapse of agriculture, with year after year of flooding and cold, people were reduced to starvation. When they couldn't eat the crops, they ate the seeds. And there's stories, uh, particularly out of Poland and Eastern Europe, where cannibalism uh, was uh, practiced just out of the necessity of uh, staying alive. There was then in 1348, the bubonic plague, the most lethal disaster that we know of in human history. For between 1348 and subsequent decades, because it lasted well into the um, 15th century in many places, uh, fully one quarter of the human population from Iceland to India was wiped out. In Germany alone, 40,000 villages and towns completely vanished. And virtually every city uh, in Europe, with almost no exceptions, had a reduction of the population by at least 50, and in some cases up to 60, 70%. No one even knew about contagion. So there was rapid, rabid, anti-Semitism. They blamed it on the Jews. That's one reason why the Jews all ended up in Eastern Europe, uh, because it was the king of Poland that gave them sanctuary. There was political collapse, the feudal order of knights and, and kings and uh, feudal armies was being uh, dramatically assaulted by advances in weaponry. Uh, in the feudal period, as you remember from the movies and the books, the knights would get on their horses and they would joust and they would fight each other in the battles and, and there was all kinds of gallantry and, and heroism. And then they came up with the crossbow. And uh, then they came up with, the, the English came up with the longbow. And those new high impact weapons were capable of penetrating armor and knocking knights right off their horse at 100 yards. And uh, so over about 75 to 100 years, the entire art of warfare was upended. Nation states began to emerge. Political chaos ensued. Peasant revolts. The famous Chiampi revolt in Florence uh, in the 1370s. So population was decimated. Politics was upended. War was transformed. Economics was completely um, uh, dysfunctional for much of Europe. And in the midst of all this, the church collapsed. The bastion of morality stability, civility for a thousand years. And they had uh, what they are, we call now the Avignon papacy, the, what they call the Babylonian exile, where the, the popes found Rome so ungovernable that they moved to southern France at the extension of a French pope. And then there was the great schism and at one point there were two popes, and then there were three popes, and then there was the conciliar movement, and they tried to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And uh, the popes, uh, fighting each other, disengaged from Rome, uh, had to somehow find revenues, and that's when they started to sell these indulgences and get, engage in what they call simony, 
uh, where they would sell virtually every office, including the papacy, for money. So the corruption of the church, the corruption of the popes, um, was uh, at historic levels, and in the face of which, Europe, in its soul, began to search for another way, starting with the Florentine Petrarch, born in Avignon because his father, a Florentine, was exiled from uh, uh, Florence, uh, along with Dante, and uh, ended up being a clerk uh, in the Pope's court in Avignon. Petrarch, as I indicated last time, studied to be a lawyer. He started to read Cicero. And what he discovered in Cicero, in the midst of all the craziness of the 14th century, where everything in the inherited tradition had been turned on its head, and corruption and vice and violence and intrigue abounded. He discovered in Cicero such extraordinary beauty, both in language and in ethos, that he realized the only place where he could find solace was in the classics. And that in ancient Rome and in ancient Greece, there was a, there was a locus of some kind of elegance, of thought, of heart, that he could cling to. And that was the genesis of the Renaissance, this notion that came to be codified as civic humanism, as it was applied in Florence, beginning in around 1402. Between 1380 and 1402, the Florentines um, were uh, in battle against Milan and Venice. In October of 1402, uh, which is the date some of the people give for the genesis of the Florentine uh, Renaissance, and I just want to name it, and then we'll move on to Machiavelli. The Duke Visconti of Milan had laid siege to Florence. The Florentines were at the point of surrender because of starvation inside the city. The chancellor of the city, a man by the name of Savatati, was on the city walls looking at the Milanese army when miraculously the Duke Visconti of Milan fell dead of the bubonic plague. Remember I said the bubonic plague broke out in 1348, but it was both an epidemic and it was also a pandemic. It entered into the human ecology. And when the Florentines took in that they had been redeemed through no act of their own, Savatati and his protege, a man by the name of Bruni, decided that this was a sign and that they were going to do something very, very spectacular for Florence. They were going to reform the educational system and create a new, a generation that would be grounded, not in anything in the contemporary world, that was corrupt and broken, but grounded in what they called civic humanism, grounded in the ethos of Greece and Rome, grounded in the notion that human beings are capable of what they called eloquentia and sep sepientia, eloquence and wisdom rhetoric and moral philosophy. And they designed a whole new educational system based on the classics, emphasizing the capacity of human beings to discern 
the morality of the good life and speak it with such eloquence and force that the political order of Florence would be reshaped in this new ethos. And they pulled it off. And what was pioneered by Florence at the beginning of the 15th century as a new impulse of civic humanism and the liberal arts gave shape to the entire European education to the present day. This is very important because I'm going to return to this as I close my remarks today. Remember Plato in the Republic stated that the only true revolution is when you begin a new educational philosophy for the next generation. That's what ubiquity is doing. That's what the wisdom school is doing. But I'm going to offer another term instead of civic humanism. And I'll save that. Because I want to now dive into Machiavelli. Because the extraordinary paradox of the Renaissance, again, was not anything that happened. <laughs> it was a worldview that emerged in the face and within the context of corruption and barbarism and cynicism without parallel virtually in European history that culminated in 1527 with the complete sack of Rome. That was the year that Machiavelli died. Machiavelli was born in um, 1469. That was the year when Lorenzo Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent, came into power. And it was Lorenzo the Magnificent that ushered into Florence the golden age of Renaissance Italy, the apogee moment of the Florentine experiment and what we remember as the Renaissance. So Machiavelli came of age at a time when humanism was in full flower. 1492, Lorenzo the Magnificent died and his son Piero gained the throne who was basically as incompetent and dysfunctional as his father was magnificent. 1494, the French and then the Spanish invaded Italy and conquered Milan, conquered Naples, and laid siege to Florence. And in the midst of all that, Savonrola, the Dominican priest, espousing the end of the world and a draconian, hyper-puritanical ethic, seized power in Florence. Machiavelli was there in the square when Savonrola eventually was hung and burned. And then Florence instituted from about 1498 to 1512, a republic again, trying to regain what had been lost at the death of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And during this time, Machiavelli became the second chancellor of Florence under a guy by the name of Saderni, brilliant Renaissance man. And Machiavelli was sent all over uh, Italy, even into France as a negotiator. He uh, was at all the city council meetings. He advised uh, Florence as a republic. And he was passionate about Florence being able to defend itself. So he proposed that Florence, like Rome, have a citizen army. And this was resisted, Soderni backed it, 
Machiavelli was given uh, the right to uh, fashion a army, small little army for Florence. And much to his surprise, none of the Florentines wanted to do it. <laughs> In those days, uh, if you wanted to fight a war, you got mercenaries. And if you've read The Prince, Machiavelli says that the mercenaries are the worst uh, fighting force to get because they have no loyalty, they're completely rapacious, and they will betray you at any moment. So he had this idea and he trained, he went out into the countryside and he recruited farm boys and unemployed uh, because there were lots of them around given the economic and political situation, dressed them up in white and gave them weapons and marched them and they had their, their um, uh, battle formations and then he went to war. And at first they succeeded in Pisa. And then they met with absolutely abject defeat because they wouldn't stand at their posts. And Machiavelli came back to Florence in disgrace right about the time that the Florentine Republic fell in 1512 as Giovanni Medici came back into Florence and seized power in an autocratic fashion. Machiavelli was disgraced and then one day an acquaintance of his was arrested for treason. And they found in his pocket a list of names. And one of the names was Machiavelli's. And so Machiavelli was imprisoned and tortured. And we even know how he was tortured. Um, they put his arms behind his back, tied his wrists together, strung him up by a rope, and they even know where it was done. And the ceilings are about 15 feet high. And you're up, strung up with this rope with your arms behind your back, and then they let the rope fall, but you don't hit the ground. It just breaks your shoulders. And apparently they did this to him uh, uh, four or five times over a period of days. And he prided himself for the rest of his life in not whimpering or answering or divulging any information. Now it later was proven that Machiavelli was innocent, but he endured. And then he was expelled. He was exiled from Florence. And he um, had four children. He went to a little family, little villa outside of Florence. It is said that he could see the, the gates of Florence in the distance. He had a little farm. And he began to sustain himself through farming. And then he began to write. And he wrote a number of books, but uh, he wrote his masterpiece in 1513. Uh, can you imagine trying to write with broken shoulders? Because <laughs> they didn't have typewriters in those days. You had to write it out. And um, that produced this little book called The Prince. At one level, he was trying to give advice to the Medici prince in Florence to get back into his good graces. Uh, but what he proceeded to do uh, is to upend political morality, in fact, ethics itself, as we know it. Because up to that point, almost universally, I would say, whether in China, or India, certainly in Europe, the great works and the great 
sages had always taught what human beings should do. It was the ought of human affairs. Machiavelli said no. Ethics starts with what is. And if you're going to be a prince and you're going to exercise power in this world, the ought's going to get you killed. Because if you do not attain power, nothing else matters. So whatever you have to do to attain power in this world, that's what is right. And that's what we want to explore today, this notion of the inversion of ethics at the hands of Machiavelli, done so skillfully that uh, Machiavellian ethics and politics now rules supreme uh, without apology. Look at the White House of the United States. Uh, look what Donald Trump did to gain the presidency. That was pure Machiavellian politics. Within that frame, then, I want to just get textual, because I love to dive into these books. And I want to start in chapter 14 um, with what his basic assumption is for writing The Prince. And that is, he says, that the single most important factor in gaining power is to understand that the first way to win a state is to be skilled in the art of war. Violence under, undergirds power, said Machiavelli. And if the prince does not understand the omnipresent reality of violence in the pursuit of power. He has no business becoming a prince. There is simply no comparison, he says, between a man who is armed and one who is not. And within this context, I, I, uh, I want to just call up, remember the metaphor throughout the latter part of the book between the fox and the lion. Machiavelli makes the point that a prince has to be half human and half beast. Now this flies in the face of antiquity. Remember Cicero's beautiful, beautiful uh, letter to his son on becoming a man in which he says in his very famous letter that a man becomes a man when he decides he no longer wants to be a beast. And Cicero articulated the four cardinal virtues of prudence and justice and temperance and fortitude. That's what constituted the Roman notion of virtu. What did it mean to be a man? You were a man because you were prudent. You exercised justice. You were temperate. And you showed fortitude under all circumstances. And these four cardinal virtues of Cicero, when combined with the three virtues of St. Paul, faith, hope, and love, came together to create the seven cardinal virtues of the Christian church. It was all predicated on humans not being bestial but being something else, more divine. And Machiavelli turned that on its head by saying, you have to be bestial because you're in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Look at nature. 
every part of nature is doing violence to any other part of nature for survival. Any of your animal shows, wildlife shows, it's the lions eating the gazelles, the spiders eating the insects, the fish eating the amoeba. Everything in life is violent, however it needs to be to survive. That is reality. That is nature. And Machiavelli said, you forget that at your peril. So he begins chapter 15 by saying, asking the question around the things for which men and especially princes are praised or blamed. And he makes this point very fundamentally. Many have dreamed up republics and principalities which have never in truth been known to exist. Now, when you think of Thomas More, Thomas More in England was a contemporary of Machiavelli. You may remember that Thomas More uh, wrote the famous Utopia, and, uh, uh, which was this imaginary state, Plato's Republic, an imaginary state, Augustine's City of God, an imaginary state where everything is beautiful. Machiavelli says, Many have dreamed up republics and principalities which have never in truth been known to exist. The gulf between how one should live and how one does live is so wide that a man who neglects what is actually done for what should be done learns the way of self-destruction rather than self-preservation. The fact is that a man who wants to live and act virtuously in every way necessarily comes to grief among so many who are not virtuous. Therefore, if a prince wants to maintain his rule, he must learn how not to be virtuous and to make use of this or not according to need. Now at the time, both Cicero and Seneca, remember Seneca, he was the Stoic philosopher uh, in the time of Nero in the 70s AD, or rather 60s AD in Rome. And it was Seneca's famous work written for the new emperor Nero on mercy. That was the most widely read advice book in Machiavelli's time, where he was calling upon Nero to use his book on mercy as a mirror, he said, so that he could discern those higher aspects of himself to be a good emperor. Nero's response was to command Seneca to commit suicide, which he did with stoic grandeur. So a prince, says Machiavelli, has of necessity to be so prudent that he knows how to escape the evil reputation attached to those vices which could lose him the state, and how to avoid those vices which are not so dangerous if he possibly can. But if he cannot, he need not worry so much about the latter. And then he must not flinch from being blamed for vices which are necessary for safeguarding his power and the state. This is because taking everything into account, he will find that some of the things that appear to be virtues will, if pursued, ruin him. And some of the things that appear to be vices will bring him security and prosperity. Think about that. And think about how our world is run by that logic. That's what capitalism is. <clears throat> you pursue money. And you engage in all kinds of marketing to make your product seem other than it is. You define happiness as a new car 
I can't, I, I can't conceive of anything more preposterous. And yet millions and billions of dollars have been spent on convincing people that right is wrong, wrong is right. And in that confusion, people buy products and power is exercised over the consumer. There's no integrity in Madison Avenue because they're being Machiavellian. There's no integrity in how they're marketing in the iPhone. It's pure Machiavellian politics. And I wanna call this to our attention because that's our world. I mentioned Trump before. Actually, Trump is a bad example of Machiavelli because what <clears throat> Machiavelli is saying here is that the prince has to seem virtuous. The advertisements have to seem like they're in your own self-interest. That's why you believe them. And Machiavelli uses the example of Ferdinand of Aragon, Ferdinand and Isabella, who was known as the most Catholic king. And yet he was a murderous, corrupt, racist bigot that expelled the Jews and the Muslims from Spain, instituted the Inquisition, sent Columbus to the America to, con to conquer those people. He was a monster, and yet he was so good at Machiavellian politics that he was known and respected around Europe as the most Catholic king. So what Machiavelli is saying here is you just don't do the, do, do the evil. You do it enveloped in the good. And that reminds us of... Uh, of Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World, or even um, uh, 1984. Uh, the, the, the author is uh, escaping me at a moment, but the, the author of 1984, where evil is good, war is peace, and the lie is the truth. The master of Machiavellian politics is able to turn everything on its head, seem what he is not, in order to seize what he doesn't deserve. George Orwell, thank you, Mark. George Orwell, 1984. If you've read George Orwell, that is another example, a masterful example of Machiavellian politics at its best. The United States has been in perpetual war uh, for nearly a hundred years now, and we call it peace. So the masters of the Machiavellian art are those who understand that this inversion is necessary and to maintain at all costs the appearance of virtue while you engage in vice to consolidate your power. He talks in uh, chapter 16 on generosity and being a miser and says that a prince always needs to be a miser. Save what you do, but strategically give away resources so that you have a reputation for being generous. <clears throat> and the one I want to go into a little bit more detail is the one on chapter 17 on cruelty and compassion. And whether it is better to be loved than feared, or the reverse. Now remember, Machiavelli was writing at the time after 1,500 years of St. Paul in Corinthians 13, and here abide faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And Machiavelli says, no. The answer is that one would like to be both the one and the other. Remember, Machiavelli says you've got to play both sides against the middle. You want to seem like you're loved, but actually you want to be feared. 
But because he says it is difficult to combine them, it is far better to be feared than loved if you cannot be both. One can make this generalization of men. They are ungrateful, fickle, liars, and deceivers. They shun danger and are greedy for profit. While you treat them well, they are yours. They would shed their blood for you, risk their property, their lives, their children, so long as the danger seems remote. But when you are in danger, they turn against you. Any prince who has come to depend entirely on promises and has taken no other precautions ensures his own ruin. <clears throat> Men worry less about doing an injury to one who makes himself loved than the one who makes himself feared. Let me say that again. It's critical. Men worry less about doing an injury to one who makes himself loved than to one who makes himself feared. The bond of love is one which men, wretched creatures that they are, break when it is to their advantage to do. But fear is strengthened by a dread of punishment, which is always effective. So let me just think, think about that in relationship to contemporary reality. The bottom line for Machiavelli uh, in chapter 18 is that a prince should not deviate from what is good if that is possible, but he should know how to do evil if that is necessary. Why, he says? Because everyone sees what you appear to be. Few experience what you really are. The prince should, as I have already suggested, determine to avoid anything that will make him hated and despised. So long as he does so, he will have done what he should and he will run no risk whatsoever if he is reproached, reproached for the other vices I have mentioned. He will be hated above all if, as I have said, he is rapacious and aggressive with regard to property and the women of his subjects. So, so he said, you can be as rapacious as you want, but don't touch a man's property and don't touch his women. Because a man will defend his property and his women Irrationally, said Machiavelli. So even in the advice around using vices of opposed to virtue, Machiavelli also says that there's limits to vice. And it's all shaped by what it takes for a prince to seize power and maintain power. And then I want to uh, conclude on, on Machiavelli um, with his penultimate chapter <clears throat> on how human affairs are governed by fortune. And it, on this point, I want to turn to my conclusion. I am not unaware, he says, that many hell have, have held and continue to hold the opinion that events are controlled by fortune and by God in such a way that the prudence of men cannot modify them. Indeed, that men have no influence whatsoever. I believe that it is probably true that fortune is the arbiter of half the things we do, leaving the other half or so to be controlled by ourselves. I compare fortune. I picked this out, Will, because of Jacob's well in the creek. 
Machiavelli says, I compare fortune to one of those violent rivers, which when they are enraged, flood the plains, tear down trees and buildings, wash soil from one place to deposit it in another. Everyone flees before them. Everybody yields to their impetus. There is no possibility of resistance. So it is with fortune. She shows her potency where there is no well-regulated power to resist her and her impetus is felt where she knows there are no embankments and dikes built to restrain her. And before I unpack that, I want to just read the final chapter, final paragraph on Fortuna. I conclude, therefore, that as fortune is changeable, whereas men are obstinate in their ways, men prosper so long as fortune and policy are in accord. And when there is a clash, they fail. I hold strongly to this, that it is better to be impetuous than circumspect, because fortune is a woman. And if she is to be submissive, it is necessary to beat and coerce her. Experience shows that she is more often subdued by men who do this by than, by, than by those who act coldly. Always being a woman, Fortune favors young men because they are less circumspect and more ardent and because they command her with greater audacity. I want to unpack this because undergirding <clears throat> Machiavelli's notion of nature as violent is this notion that there's a power to nature. There is a force to nature that if you are not in accord with it, it will blow you away. And to deal with it, this feminine thing, you have to beat her and coerce her and be obstinate in the face of her. That's the most essential, succinct description of patriarchy I believe I've ever read. The entire foundation of Machiavellian politics to do anything one can to seize power, to lie, to murder, to cheat, to engage in manipulation is predicated on this notion that the human being stands in contrast to Fortuna. And that only by doing violence to each other, like a wolf, like a lion, like a fox, he says, a fox you have to deceive, a lion you have to eat, a wolf you have to be a predator, is based on an understanding of nature as enemy, an overpowering enemy, but one in which the obstinate man capable of violence can control. Now let's, let's just think about that. In light of our current challenge for Renaissance, and as I said at the end of my lecture last time, I want to I wanna, uh, call it out today that we, like 
then are in a world of such dysfunction and corruption and greed and violence that like Petrarch, we have to look somewhere else than the inherited traditions to give us solace and to give us direction. In his day, they looked to the past and expressed it through civic humanism. In our day, I would argue that we have to look to the earth and what I would call eco-humanism for us to find our way. It may not be like in the Renaissance that we can triumph. In the end, the Renaissance was a breath of fresh air that ultimately was consumed by the fires of the sack of Rome in 1527, which many historians demark as the end of the Renaissance. It may be in our day, we do not triumph over the Trumps and the climate change and the monopoly capitalism and the scientific reductionism. But what is welling up around the world that ubiquity is participating in by trying to reinvent education is an eco-humanism where the earth is becoming our ordering principle. And if you simply reread the, those um, uh, uh, lines of of uh, Machiavelli on Fortuna. Uh, you have the way forward. Men prosper so long as fortune and humanity are in accord. And when there is a clash, humanity fails. I strongly hold this that because fortune is a woman, it is necessary to align with her and to conjoin with her as a child to the mother. Experience shows that she is more often nurturing by men and women who do this than those who treat her coldly. Always being a woman, Fortuna favors those who serve her because they are circumspect, they are ardent, and because they respect and honor her with their virtue. So as we think about Machiavelli, let us understand that the world has taken his advice. And 600 years after he lived, we are paying the price of our embrace of the prince and a world in which vice supplants virtue and ethics is oriented to power for the sake of power. We can no longer look back to Rome or Greece. We have to look back further than Rome and Greece because our crisis is commensurately more severe. We have to look back to the times of the mother goddess, the times of the shaman, the times of the indigenous mind, 
we have to move beyond civic humanism to eco-humanism. And even as Machiavelli turned traditional ethics and politics and economics and science on its head, we, in our day, have to turn Machiavelli on his head and embrace Fortuna as our mother in the spirit of loving children. The prince must be supplanted by the princess. So uh, Mark, then uh, Will, then Georgie, and then we'll open it up to students. Well, thank you, Jim. That's, as always, brilliantly done, and I really uh, appreciate it. I hope uh, I can make just a couple of remarks here that, are, that would give a, be received in the sense of perhaps giving a, um, a little nuance to the, um, to the spirit of your remarks, which, as I say, I thought were extremely powerful. Um, and I, 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 th I think I'd make two points. One, that the understanding of nature, the use of the um, argument of allying with nature can be slippery. And uh, that uh, I don't, I'm not defending Machiavelli on the whole to point <laughs> out some elements of why he didn't consider himself evil. <laughs> um, the, um, as, if you read Machiavelli's discourses, you would no, notice that his um, <laughs> political sentiments were very much along Republican lines. He, he really wanted much more of a popular input into government than it would seem from the, from the argument of the prince. Um, so he, he, he had this notion that the more ideal government would involve much more than simply the power of the prince. But he was, he was making an argument, I think, in his own mind based on what he considered human nature, what he considered the natural. Um, and that is that, that, that rulers needed to recognize that this power drive, and he's not the first person to say that, nor the last, this drive towards power is a pretty fundamental aspect of who we are. And that we, um, if we do not recognize the reality of that and deal with reality, the reality of it, that the whole society could suffer all the more. Um, the, the, um, in his own mind, I would say, he saw himself not as um, promoting fictions, but as ultimately looking at what's most real. And if the ruler didn't do that, the result would be um, the total breakdown of social order and utter chaos and civil war and carnage, which he considered coming out of that experience that you so um, eloquently described of, of the um, social, of the warfare at the time, it, it, would, it would be the worst possible condition is, is uh, the lack of social order. So that's remained a realist argument in politics. Oh, yes. and, and, I think, and I think it's just important to, to acknowledge that there is um, uh, where the realists stand and that they, they don't, um, they see themselves as aligned with nature and not as um, uh, against it and not as, um, as, um, hoping for the human condition to be worse. So the other, the other point I'd like to make is um, that uh, this goes back to, I think most pointedly, the love versus fear. Um, 
it seems important. What Machiavelli did was to throw off all the theological, and for good reason, you know, throw off all the theological, um, what he considered clap-clap at the time, and try to look at actuality. And, and he, um, and, you know, but I think it's important to acknowledge that, or to, to see that if you do that entirely, you're very likely to end up with a picture of the world like Machiavelli, like Hobbes who followed him, where, where the, um, these darker aspects of human nature are, are just considered so powerful that that's where politics needs to start by recognizing it. Um, if we are to get out of that, if we are to see humanity as capable of something, um, uh, capable of, of better angels, of having better angels in its nature, to use Lincoln's phrase, uh, then we need some kind of um, wider context. Uh, we need a wider context that involves some element of spiritual perception, something beyond uh, perceiving something beyond the material world. And uh, you have made a powerful case for, for uh, ecohumanism as a way of, of, as really, as I hear you say, practically the, the soul will lie of a way to do that. And um, to me, I'd just like to say that there, there's um, a lot of possibilities about how to frame to experience and frame that broader spiritual context that I think takes in a wider embrace of human nature than Machiavelli acknowledged. Uh, that there are, are, are many traditions, some of which have a rich history in, in um, Western civilization, uh, as well as all human civilizations that uh, embrace a wider spiritual context that makes a place for love as a essential and indeed vital characteristic of, of um, li human life and even politics. And that um, I, I would hope that as um, ubiquity goes forward that we can also see a place for uh, numerous other traditions along with the echo humanism as a as a guidepost for our lives so i'll i'll stop there but just as a quick comment i you're absolutely right you know the exercise of power is like the ring in lord of the rings it's inherently paradoxical it's inherently corrosive and uh whether you're ashoka in um third century bc india converted to buddhism your Muhammad leading the armies in Arabia. Um, you can be as ethical as you can be and want to be, but in exercising power, you're ultimately exercising coercive force. And there's no political leader that I know of anywhere, anytime, that has been able to escape that basic contradiction of the ring. And um, um, so I I think, this, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I think that, that Machiavelli was grappling uh, with um, that contradiction and laying out the realities. The difference is that he called that reality ethics, ethical, whereas up to, up to him, they would call it unethical and keep the contradiction in tight focus so that the prince always knew that when he was engaging in vice, it was vice. Machiavelli's genius and permission was to create a worldview in which vice became a virtue and virtue became a vice. And, uh, but that, you know, anybody who seizes power has got to grapple with all those issues, absolutely. 
There is no escape. No Could escape. I make one quick observation yeah. here? I, when, when I, uh, I used to teach Machiavelli in a course on um, Western political thought in uh, Mexico. And what, one way I did it was to uh, look at the actions of the university administration. So my point here is that some of these principles, these principles affect uh, not only world leaders, not only, not only the Trumps of the world, but they're things that any of us who are interested in organizational dynamics uh, often end up looking at in one way or another. And, uh, my my way of teaching this was to go through. We had a new administration at the time. It was quite it was quite unpopular, and uh, my my way of teaching it was to list the various actions that the the um, uh, president had taken in terms of who he had fired, who he had, who he had called in, where he decided to live. All of these various mundane actions of a of a leader on a fairly small scale, by the terms we're looking at and ask the students whether or not Machiavelli would have approved of those, those things. And it's interesting that you have, you have some analogies and parallels where we didn't, the president wasn't uh, splitting um, his predecessor in half or his, his vice chairman, as it were, and, um, and putting him up in the public square in two pieces but he was firing him, and, <laughs> and you would have a very, a, a similar kind of dynamic in these sure, sure. Um, social organizations that we have to look at even if we're running a university. Totally, totally. Caution well taken. <laughs> will. You know, uh, I think I'm gonna yield the floor to Georgie so I can hear the feminine gender's point of view before I make a few comments. Good, Georgie. Thank you, Will. I really, really appreciate it. Um, sorry, the light is a little bit gray here. Sun is going down in Hungary. Thank you very much for your presentation, Jim. I really appreciate your wisdom and knowledge. I really love the very end when you were talking about the princess, the princess energy. I was thinking about the same. And uh, Machiavelli, obviously, he was 100% fully-fledged masculine species. And I think he didn't have a coherent understanding of nature. So, but I let Will to expand on that. Um, when I was contemplating on Machiavelli and, uh, and his prince, uh, there was a certain sadness and dislike arose in me. And I was observing these feelings and the feelings um, went that deep to, to see for me anyway, that how much actually uh, the world has progressed since Machiavelli wrote the prince. Because obviously his, his prince is, is coercion and yeah, fear. So do we actually have any ruler whose ruling is based on love, not just love and service for, for humankind, for nation, for nature. How much have you progressed in the last 500 years? I don't think a huge amount. And that's the sadness, really. And there's the dislike in me. And him giving advice in a handbook to, uh, to princes how to rule well, obviously it is not a very holistic, uh, integral advice. So he was far from it really. And the coercion of women and so forth. So hmm, no need to comment on that. <laughs> but uh, before I pass on the word back to Will, thank you very much. I, I would like to read just three lines or other four sentences. And this is from our beloved Sufi Rumi. I would love to see a ruler who would abide by these words. This is what he said. Is there a way to grasp what love means without becoming a lover first? Love cannot be explained. It can, it can only be experienced. Love cannot be explained, yet it, it explains all. Yeah, so it's not coercion, not fear, but I think we need to evolve much more to reach that level. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Bill. Yes, thank you, Georgie. Uh, just a, a couple of comments. 
strangely, Machiavelli was really grappling with the fallout of the Abrahamic religions. And what I mean by that is he recognized that Judaism, Christianity, and then also Islam had made an enemy of the beast. And his way of approaching that was to embrace the dark side of the beast. Red blood, tooth, and claw. And in that way, he also helped give birth to a strange religion of scientific reductionism. So on the one hand, he and, and the scientific, scientists of the 20th century uh, and 19th century saw the difficulty of the Abrahamic religions, of the split. And I, I also think, as you know, that goes back to uh, some of the strands of Greek philosophy. And in that way, we have thrown all of our energy into the competitive dark side of the force of the river. And we have forgotten that it's also that river that nourishes us and heals us and makes us whole. And what I would suggest, the truth that Machiavelli missed in encountering the forces of nature instead of trying to conquer nature, that forceful side is there to humble us. And as we face the unleashed forces within the heart of mother nature who's rebalancing herself, that our first move is to acknowledge our peace in the unleashing. And in that way, we would take the first step of compatibility. Also, just one other little piece. Linda Tucker and I were talking some time back, the, the um, princess of the white line. And she pointed out to me that there is archaeological evidence that lions taught humans how to eat meat. And that were it not for that compatibility, we usually think, of course, you, of course, you don't want to put your head in the mouth of a lion. On the other hand, she points out, there is room for communication of important information. So I've been trying to track down that uh, archaeological evidence that she mentioned, but I haven't yet been able to find it. <laughs> great, great lecture. I just marvel at the contextual um, sojourn that you take us on, Jim. And, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, it's <clears throat> just to make a quick comment, then we'll open it up to the to the students, so those of you on the panel, Annette and Beverly and Myra, Scott, Yulia, I don't know who EMI, PMI is, but uh, whoever you are, I'd love to hear from you in a moment. Um, I, think, I think that to touch on Georgie's comment first, I think um, what Machiavelli would say to Rumi is, 
that's easy for you to say as a poet. But Rumi was not a prince. And I want to emphasize this for a moment because the ethics that Machiavelli is articulating is not for poets. It's not for ordinary people. It's only for people who, who aspire for power in a state. And that when you aspire for power as, in a state, you have to understand that, like they say of politics, it's a contact sport. There's going to be competitors. And if you want to get to the top of the pyramid, you got to fight your way up there. And so I think he would honor Rumi as a poet. And he would probably say that Rumi should appear in the court of the prince. But if the prince adhered to Rumi's advice, he would probably lose his power. And that comes back to Mark's point that there's complexities here that we all need to grapple with when we, when we exercise power. And it's true if you're a university president, as I am. I'm, I sometimes have to deal with contradictions that are very, very uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, we're living out several right now in the university's history. And um, uh, uh, power seems to call up the contradictions in the human soul almost in a way that no other orienting principle does. Um, and um, in that sense, you know, Will, I, I agree with you. And, and I know this is another conversation, Mark. I don't think there are many different things around which humanity should be organizing itself. I think it's only the earth. And not unless and until we get to that fundamental reality that we are part of, a, of this ecosystem and we have to stop damaging who we most essentially are as our grounding fundamental principle. That's why I was wanting to put the term out there of eco-humanism. Eco-humanism is foundational to our day, even as civic humanation, humanism was, was foundational to the, to the Renaissance. Um, they girded themselves in Greece and Rome. That was their foundation. And I believe that we have to, to ground ourselves uh, in the larger eco field and every other aspect of our humanity has to be founded on that, derivative from that, or it won't serve the direction that humanity needs to go because our Machiavellian exercise of power has almost taken the human race out of the game. And I would, I would emphasize one thing that I always think about. You know, 95% of all the species that have ever lived in the four and a half billion years of life on this planet are extinct. So just because we're here now doesn't mean we're going to endure. We can only endure by paying attention. And we have so not been paying attention, we've unleashed forces on this planet, mostly around climate change and economic exploitation, that are cannibalizing us. And nothing less than a radical shift. That's what Petrarch was grappling with. What is this radical shift that can renew life? And, and um, so that's a, Maybe we'll do a great book uh, on this question of, is there a foundational principle below which you cannot go? And unless you have it, you cannot survive. Is there an absolute? And I say, yes, there is, and it's the earth. And the entire edifice of Ubiquity University is, 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 is grounded on that what I believe great truth.
but uh, uh, I just wanted to flag that because <laughs> you, you and I have had this debate for years now. <laughs> and so I want to honor it. But let's get before you, before you. <laughs> as much as you like the last word, Jim. Uh, my retort would simply be that there are numbers of paths that embrace that truth. Oh, good. Well, we can agree on that. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, hi, Beverly. How are you? Do you have any comment? Um, actually, I'd like to tell you a story about a, a Machiavellian person. Um, I uh, used to have a piece of property on the Sunshine Coast, which is a very pristine waterfront, and um, there... Uh, I, I lived in a little shed there for a while, which is where I, you know, first thought about going to Wisdom University and so on. But after I'd gone into the caves with Apila and all the right, I came back and I built a house that I tried to build it, you know, it's very in tune with nature, very much part of uh, the landscape built into the rock. Anyway, uh, about three lots down from me, and I succeeded. It was very beautiful, but I've had, unfortunately had to sell it now, and I'm living at the University of British Columbia, which is really nice. But Three lots down from me, there was a man named Chip Wilson, and Chip Wilson founded Lululemon. Hello. I don't know if you have Lululemon where you are, but everybody in Vancouver walks around in Lululemon, and there's Lululemon stores everywhere, and there's, it's just like Lululemon land out here. And what he did was he bought a piece of property that didn't have a secure moorage, but it had coastline. And to make a long story short, as of last Tuesday, against massive protest and against environmental studies and against the fact that there's an endangered species of marbled merlet, he's got pile drivers putting a great big enormous long dock sticking straight out in front of his neighbor's property and he bought the property next to theirs so he could put it in front of their house rather than his house. And yet this is a person who is selling yoga pants. That's how he got to $2.2 billion. And when I was listening to you, I thought, wow, is this ever an example of someone who perceives to look like he's doing good, but he's actually the, been the largest uh, donor for the last provincial government. He's had a whole street in Vancouver, basically, you know, I can't say he has, but most people think it has, because he built a big house there and he didn't want any traffic. And he really is like the prince of Vancouver. And when you were describing this, I just thought, wow, I, you know, <laughs> how do you ever counter this, this kind of ability to succeed financially and then exert that kind of power? Yeah. Well, you know, it, 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 in Machiavelli's terms, it's the person who is willing to embrace both the light and the shadow side for the sake of power that is almost an unstoppable force. You know, he would pit the obstinate man against even Fortuna herself. Well, that's, it's, this is such a, an example of it, Jim. It's, yeah. it, it's like, wow, they decided to write that scenario right here in front <laughs> for me to tell you about today. Because it just, you know, my neighbor phoned and said, oh, we were having breakfast and all of a sudden these pile drivers arrived. And everybody had, you know, fought this. It was, it even got a cartoon in, in the New York, one of the New York newspapers. And it was sort of saying, you know, then they had, you know, jokes about him saying, you know, you ought to tell these, these guys in their yoga pants to not stick their big docks out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's go to, thank you for that. Let's, uh, Yulia Antonova, do you have anything to say? Greetings, Jim. Hello. Uh, sorry, I have issues with camera. Uh, but I can you hear me great? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, Welcome. I posted, yeah, thank you. I posted my question actually in the chat, uh, but maybe oh. it came unnoticed. Yeah, I will just uh, tell it. So, um, yeah, really, what really struck me um, in your previous lecture is the thing... Uh, about the Renaissance and uh, how can we re repeat it right now? 
in order to um, eliminate or minimize the influence of Machiavellian rule in the modern world. And I started thinking on uh, are there any signs and symbols uh, of Renaissance today? Because actually people who lived in Italy in the 14th century and in 15th century, I guess as well, they didn't know that they live in a Renaissance age. They didn't notice that it's a rebirth age because there were just a mediocre people and only the Renaissance was discovered lately. So I will, I've been thinking maybe we also now live in a Renaissance and we just have to find out, find the symbols and help them to grow, help them to sprout and to fight the Machiavellian rule across the world right now. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Yulia is one of our new students, so I want to welcome you, Yulia. Thank you for, for speaking yeah. up. Uh, thank this you. Is a nice, uh, 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 it's, very, it's an excellent final question. Let me just comment, then we'll bring this to a close. I'll do it very, very briefly. Uh, it's actually true that the Renaissance, nobody in the Renaissance knew they were in the Renaissance. <laughs> the Renaissance was a, was a term first used 250 years later by a, uh, a French historian. And by the way, you know, it was Petrarch that came up with the term Middle Ages. People in the Middle Ages had no idea that they were in the Middle Ages either. And um, uh, he noted that Cicero in the Roman Latin was beautiful. And then it got corrupted and then in his day, Latin was being resuscitated to becoming beautiful again. So it was Petrarch and the Renaissance people that coined the term the Middle Ages. Because when they looked back, they saw Greece and Rome, and then they saw this kind of murky, corrupted period in the middle, and then their day. And that's why it became known as the Renaissance. So if you want to know how the Middle Ages got its name, it was because of Petrarch and the people in the Renaissance. And I think similarly in our day, I think we're more conscious than they were. I believe that one of the distinctions of our time is we're conscious of the Renaissance that we're in. And I would give um, uh, a number of indicators, one from Paul Ray, the sociologist, that 30, 40% of the American public, of the European public, Japanese, and in cosmopolitan cities all over the world are embracing a new ethic, a new forms of spirituality, new forms of politics. Uh, just since the Second World War, uh, the explosion in NGOs around the world, there's no issue known to humanity where there's not dozens, if not hundreds, of NGOs working that particular problem. That's an unprecedented phenomenon in human history. NGOs practically didn't exist except in isolated examples before the end of the Second World War. And now human beings all over are working on every conceivable issue. Look at the social change, the women's movement, the gay lesbian movement, um, uh, the civil rights movement, uh, et cetera, the environmental movement, the anti-nuclear movement, all these movements are slowly reshaping uh, humanity and I think are contributing to a renaissance. I think uh, climate change, the crisis of climate change is making us aware of uh, the imperative of realigning humanity's relationship um, with the earth. Uh, I think Ubiquity University, the wisdom school, and like-minded institutions uh, worldwide are examples of a rebirth of, of, I would say, the life force of Eros in the face of Thanatos, in the face of death, uh, the death wish, which is so strong uh, in, um, certainly in Western culture and increasingly in the world consumer culture. So I think... Um, uh, we're very conscious that we need to change dramatically and quickly for humanity to survive. 
I think there are, are, are more and more conscious people uh, that are, are naming it uh, and living it and taking their stand on a new relationship with the earth, uh, whatever the pathway that one treads uh, to get there. So um, that's a nice uh, tonality with which to end our call. It's been uh, a journey uh, going through Machiavelli because we've had to grapple with that which we most find repulsive about our humanity. And Machiavelli put it in our face and said, it's true. And we orient our exercise of power accordingly. Don't kid yourself. Now we're paying a price. And nothing less than a renaissance of the human spirit, a rebirth of the human spirit, as Yulia named, will, sufficient, will be sufficient to uh, ensure our viability. And so I wanna end with this notion of civic humanism, which characterized the original Renaissance and eco-humanism, which I believe should characterize our Renaissance as the princess replaces and informs the prince and thereby redesigns the humanity that we all know also is within us and which we now need to manifest in very powerful and elegant and eco-sensitive ways. So thank you everyone, uh, all the students um, show up on Facebook and we'll continue the dialogue. And then next month in November, we'll be having one of our own doctoral, uh, uh, doctoral students, our alumni with our doctorate, Karen Castle, talk about Inanna and uh, give us uh, two lectures on the earliest known work of literature associated with a specific author, the daughter of Sargon the Great, 2300 years BC. So that'll be next month, it'll be on the goddess Inanna. Thank you everyone.